Let, now let's hear uh, Ellen Silbergeld. Uh, she's work. She's she works in uh, environmental um, engineering, medical. Uh, also, a teacher at medical school. Worked at APA, CCDC, and World Bank, OIT, PNUMA, among others. She has worked with public policies, incorporating mechanistic me toxicology, and her interest areas are cardiovascular risks of arsenicum, arsenic, arsenic and lead, environmental impacts in the these projects and our uh, epidemiological studies, interactions between the environment and pathogens. Some of these research are international, uh, also lead and cadmium. She has uh, uh, developed, uh, made some developments in the Amazon, in Thailand, and in Mongolia. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I, my goal today is to try to challenge us all to think more energetically and in a more focused and perhaps somewhat um, more concerned manner about the current state of information that we have and the need to find important and feasible ways forward in terms of giving the promise to the title of this important symposium. But I wanted to start because for me coming here, to this audience, how many of you are actually involved in nanoengineering, actually making or characterizing nanomaterials? How many in the audience? Okay. How many people are involved in nanotoxicology? Okay. All right. Um, okay. I also want to indicate that in this field, as you've heard, uh, from Dr. Rocco. This is a complex field, but it's also complex for all of us who are involved in it. And one of the points I'd like to make at the very beginning, of course, many obligations and, uh, and thanks. And I'm going to refer to some of the results of a workshop convened at Johns Hopkins at which Dr. Shvedova was present and uh, draw upon the consensus judgment of my colleagues. I come from a background in both engineering and toxicology, but I want to state quite clearly that I come from a university that has an institute of nanobiotechnology. And you may say, and it's true, my research has been supported by what you might call the university academic complex. So we all come here from specific positions and viewpoints about this. This is really my key slide and my concern. And that is, can we really catch up to this technology? We've not had a very good record of a recent history of humans since the Industrial Revolution of recognizing new technologies and deliberately attempting to position ourselves in a way to understand them. And I fear that we're doing the same pattern with nanotechnology. This is from one of my favorite books of philosophy, Alice in Wonderland. And it reminds me, because the Red Queen said to Alice, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast. So I hope you will take that perhaps as our motto uh, from whatever field you are working in related here. I approach it as a toxicologist, and I think that our field, and I was glad to hear some of my colleagues in the field echo these comments, that our arrangement, if you will, with society that supports us and encourages us is to provide assurance and that has many different aspects. We are engaged in research and application to industry in order to help them select nanomaterials and products that optimize benefit and minimize risk, as Ron White referred to, perhaps green nano. But we also have some obligations to both industry and government in selecting data requirements. What is it that we need to know in order to reach these decisions? to governments as well in assisting in the development of transparent and acceptable uh, decision making that is acceptable to all stakeholders, to both governments and the public in prioritizing investments in acquiring 
knowledge related to these goals, to the public as well in developing knowledge without bias that supports the acceptability of acceptable technology, and finally to everyone to try and at least set a boundary around the unforeseen impacts of new technologies. And I want to stand before you today and say we have not done this. We have not succeeded in doing this at all. We have universally missed the opportunity for precaution. So anyone who talks about the application of the precautionary principle to nanotechnology is not speaking any realistic comment. For example, in the home of precaution, the European Union, some of the most highly dispersive uses of nanomaterials have been approved, such as the addition of cerium oxides as catalysts to automotive fuels. We're failing to act even with prudence. New products, with the exception of some drugs, are really not reviewed, let alone regulated or tested, in any country. In fact, we have not met our own social responsibilities as a science. Much of the research in our area is disorganized and it's poorly annotated. So taken together, it is very difficult to know what it says. In academia, there are those certainly on the outside who would say this, that we are compromised because many universities, such as mine, are highly involved in support from the private sector. And even if I may think that I'm acting without bias, I'm in a context that is certainly colored by various relationships. And also I want to say, in spreading blame to everyone, <laughs> that the public has not really been engaged in this issue in a meaningful way. And I think that non-governmental organizations and the media in large part have not led or stimulated an informed discussion of these issues, at least not in my country. Now, I think there's some reasons why we come up here and we present the kind of picture that we do to you. And that I like to say that we have some stages in terms of coming to grips with nanotechnology, in terms of toxicology. The first stage, I would say, was one of denial, which went on for some years, in which it was asserted, well, they're too small, and they actually, they're not very much of them, even when we start making them, so it can't really be a problem. Of course, it is their very size that makes them interesting because they're at the scale of biophysical events within cells and organisms. But that was said for many years. Then there was a stage I would call confidence, which is that they're really not different from bulk or macro scale materials, and we know about those. So we can take that information and import it directly. And we have a good example in my country, the US Food and Drug Administration actually stated that it was not necessary for it to test the use of titanium oxide in the nano form in cosmetics because they already knew about macro titanium implants. That means something this big put in a broken bone would really be inferential about nanoscale particulate applied to the skin. Then we moved, I think, out of this stage into a stage of beginning a more serious consideration. The first was I call the guilt by association. And this was important because it was the first suggestion that, you know, actually inferences from other sources of knowledge might in fact suggest that there are reasons for concern. And as Ron and others have mentioned, many of the most cogent articles in this area came from Oberdorster and others who reminded us of the history of knowledge on the health effects of ambient particulate matter. And of course, much very important work has come from Brazil, from the laboratory of Saldiva and others in Sao Paulo. And generally, we have seen over the past 15 years re-estimation of the health risks from particulate matter, which demonstrate that most of the risks seems to be related to the smallest fraction of naturally occurring nanomaterials in air. I think we are now at this stage, which I would call the dawning of complexity, and I thank Dr. Riviere for introducing the context of thinking in a very serious and complex way that nanomaterials really are different. And Dr. Rocco started out explaining that to us, that it really was in this extraordinary size range that unpredictable and different things happen. That can be valuable, but it also signals that that's how we have to think about these materials. That is what this means. And I give you an example because I know it's very 
uh, hot right now, and that is whether nano silver has to be considered in any meaningful way, or can we look at bulk silver, which has been used in disinfection and in biocidal applications for, for decades. And this is just one study conducted with zebrafish, and I put that up because there's some interesting thoughts about the zebrafish model in terms of paths forward in toxicity. And what this, these data showed was that when you tested bulk or colloidal silver compounds, there was no embryotoxicity in this system, but when you looked at different sizes of nanosilver, it was highly embryotoxic. And so it just means these inferences cannot be lightly drawn. So are we really ready to start? I would like perhaps to say, could we get over the inter introductory phase of this meeting, it's almost four o'clock, could we stop talking about how we have to know about this and start talking about how we're going to know about this? And that's what I'd like to leave you. You know, can we really summarize what we do know? Can we even set a boundary on what we don't know? Sometimes that helps us figure out expeditious ways forward. Can we prioritize the knowledge that we need to have to move forward? Can we in some way figure out how to operationalize or make it happen that we acquire the critical knowledge? One path forward people have suggested is to infer higher order effects from intermediate endpoints and signals. That's a very big topic in the field of toxicology right now, and its application in nano, I think, is under considerable discussion. And we have one area that we really have not spent a lot of time on, although you've heard it hinted about this morning from Dr. Shvedova and Dr. Montero, which is the real lack of data that we have about chronic exposures and chronic effects. And everything we know about toxicology suggests that over time, as long as we reduce high-level exposures, this is where the main health burden is likely to occur. So what are our first steps? And this I want to draw upon the workshop that was held at Hopkins. First off, we need to start designing experiments rationally. Much of the literature that's currently published in the field of nanotoxicology, not by any of my colleagues in this room, I'm happy to say, but I think they will all agree with me, is not rational. It's very difficult to figure out why a certain study design was set up, why the conditions were used, even why the particular target organ or organism or cell was used. We obviously need to consider the likely routes of exposure and contact when we design our, our studies. And we need to evaluate the behavior of materials before, I would say, during and after the experiment, whether it's in vitro or in vivo. These sound very simple, I hope, but they are largely ignored in this field. We need to have full annotation of all studies in nanotoxicology. We need multiple methods for that annotation, as you've heard this morning. These would include, but not be limited to, analytic and surface characterization properties, but there's a whole range that may be necessary, and at present, it may be premature to stipulate what these would be probably as many as possible. We have a very great need for the use for standard materials, both in terms of standardization of the nanomaterials that we actually use. I have to tell you, when I go by posters or even students in my own department who are starting to do some nanotox work and they're ordering nanomaterials off the web, my hair stands on end with electricity because I know from day to day and batch to batch they have no idea what they're getting. We need positive and negative control materials and all sorts of reference materials. We need materials particularly as we move into exposure assessment, both in terms of measuring within environmental compartments as well as physiologic compartments. And we need, I think, to think in a very imaginative way. Frequently in toxicology we have a debate between toxicology testing methods that give us information on apical or integrated organismic level responses, and those that give us information on uh, pathways or cellular changes. We actually need to find ways to combine these. Apical studies that use high throughput systems that are informative, should we care to dissect them, uh, about signal transduction. That's why I showed you the picture of the zebrafish. And there is interest that some of these systems, which are whole organisms, and therefore present even lifespan information within a very feasible, in terms of resources and money, feasible 
uh, scenario, uh, both the zebrafish and C. elegans have certainly been used for a variety of purposes, and it represents one possible way forward to meet the demand for apical or endpoint information that is relevant to human health, in addition to taking advantage of some of the more molecular techniques we have available. I think we went through this. Um, so can we utilize a knowledge-based system? And Ron just spoke about structure activity approaches, and people have been interested in this because, of course, in many respects, nanotechnology is all about structure, and people play with structure and other attributes in order to gain the characteristics that seem to be advantageous for a specific application. People have attempted to make groupings of nanomaterials uh, by various relatively simple categories, but I think that this is probably going to turn out to be illusory, or it's going to be a long time in coming before we can approach or use this as a way of establishing a roadmap. I've been thinking about the issue, I think maybe because my background's half in engineering and that I work with the Department of Materials Science at Johns Hopkins in urging that we take nanomaterials seriously. I said that at the beginning in terms of respecting the fact that they are not just little, small micromaterials. They are, you know, children are not small adults, as we have learned in epidemiology and public health. Nanomaterials are not just small micromaterials. And if we take them seriously, we rem remember that the definitional, you know, definitional distinction between nanomaterials and ambient nanoparticles is the deliberateness of the activity that goes into their formation. So there is a relationship between the engineering processes and the properties that are desired and attained. In addition, there's a great deal of knowledge within material science about the effects of relatively small modifications, not just size and shape or con constituent components, but also very subtle aspects of surface in terms of effects on these properties. And so one way to start is to think about the potential for unintended effects, which we could define as hazards, of these properties that we want to engineer in, to, in biological and ecological systems. It's not the only way, but it is a way perhaps to start to think. There are a variety of aspects of purposeful design, and we can think about unintended effects, stability characteristics. Even for compounds that are going to be active, they have to remain in a stable form before they're deliberately activated, be it by light or by magnetism in terms of nanobiomedicine or other activities in the environment. Uh, many of them have this high surface to mass ratio, which is quite attractive for some desired properties. Many of them have the ability, which at times is deliberate, other times just relates to other properties that have been engineered to cross membranes or other kinds of partitions, specific binding, you've heard about this, to proteins and intracellular macromolecules, as well as the unintended formation of various protein coronas and other interactions, and of course this growing interest in using them uh, to transport material. Now there's a sort of relationship between some of these desired material science characteristics and the nomenclature of toxicology. If we design materials to achieve access, that has a relationship to thinking about toxicokinetics, as you've already heard about. If we design nanomaterials to bind and modify some target protein, some cellular constituent, some contaminant in the environment, that may have a relationship to what toxicologists refer to as toxicodynamics. And if we think about materials that are designed to deliver, within biotic systems or outside, we certainly might think about the possibility of co-exposures. So engineering access, a tremendous amount of work, certainly in nanobiomedicine, goes into figuring out what very small modifications to a nanoparticle can do in order to change the ability of the material to enter. Now I know that Dr. Montero showed us ways of studying the unintended potential for entrance across skin membranes or other systems, but there's a great deal of engineering that can give us insight into those characteristics that might permit this to happen when we don't want it to happen. So I'm trying to argue that from the field of material science and engineering, we may know more about some of the characteristics that correlate with certain parameters of bioactivity that could be useful for us in moving forward. We can, in fact, the very deliberate uh, schemes of uh, modifying materials so that they can uh, obtain access 
uh, at Hopkins, uh, Dr. Hayes and others, Haynes and others, have developed a what they call a muco-inert mucus penetrating particle, which will potentially, I want to stress potentially, because an awful lot of what we've heard today are not things that actually exist. They're all potential. Um, as with a lot of new technology, the things that come into play first are things like cosmetics and tennis rackets. Later, we're going to cure cancer, but right now we've got the cosmetics. Um, so this is to generate a particle that can cross the mucous membrane, which is a major barrier for a lot of drugs that we'd like to deliver into biologic systems, including humans. And in fact, very specific modifications will confer the ability of particles to move through that protective layer, which is one of the first barriers of the lung. So again, we know what those modifications are. So we can look at other particles that are not being developed for medical applications and begin to ask whether those are things we would like to suggest in a green engineering way would perhaps not be the best thing to engineer into your particle that you're going to use for some other purpose. Engineering binding, I think, is likely, if I were to make a prediction, I think this could be one of the major areas by which the unintended effect of nanomaterials might occur, at least in the short term, before we get into the more complex system-based engineering that uh, Mike talked about. And this, again, is a very hot topic in the area of nanobiomedicine in which we want to deliver drugs, we want to deliver diagnostics. You heard a good deal about that this morning. Um, and we have a number of molecules that have been designed to do this, from uh, nanoliposomes to directional antigens on uh, various forms, and of course, um, uh, carbon nanotubes as well. Once again, a great deal is known about the specific engineering on the surface, which allows the attachment of wanted substances. Now, let me remind you that in the field of ambient particulate matter, this is now recognized increasingly as likely to be a mechanism of the toxic effects of very small particles, that they pick up chemicals, gas phase chemicals within the air, and then deliver them along with themselves deep into the alveoli and facilitate transport of the chemical itself. In fact, there is a parallel set of information that's been developed very elegantly by scientists at CIIT looking at nasal uptake, that is through um, the olfactory nerve upon inhalation through the nose. So we know this happens. This is work by Saldiva and others, and in fact demonstrates this. And this is why I would be willing to bet a kyperenia that this might be a big mechanism of toxic effects with the environmental dispersion of nanoparticles, the unintended, unmonitored pickup of other chemicals in the environment, and then the facilitated transfer of these chemicals within biologic systems. So it's really, in many cases, it could be in the right place, but maybe at the wrong time. This is some work by my student, uh, Dr. Catherine Clark, in which she looked at silica nanoparticles and their ability to bind to DNA. I want to stress these are molecules that have not been developed for DNA diagnostics, but based on their behavior, functional characteristics, it was the opinion of our colleagues in material science that they might be likely to bind to DNA. So she did some very clever gel-facilitated analyses of binding of these materials to consensus sequences of DNA, and you see here saturable binding with relatively low kinetic characteristics. What would be the result of this? Well, we know this DNA has changed its shape because it's behaving differently on an electrophoretic plate. But to my knowledge, nobody's ever really extensively looked at what that means. Joel Pounds, et cetera, have published some papers on changes in heat maps, but is it changing the expression of specific genes relative to the unpenetrated DNA in a whole cell? So I would like to just conclude with another of my favorite sources of guidance in thinking about life, which is, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, to say that, you know, when we're talking about nanomaterials, we really are not in Kansas anymore. And I hope we will stop referring back to other materials and to the possibility of avoiding the extremely hard work and hard thinking and rapid thinking that we're going to have to do to deal with this extraordinary new technology in a way that truly benefits us. Thank you.